Seven pieces that you're going to read. So I'm going to move over here. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to start with a poem I wrote a couple of years ago. Bone Island. I dig my bones each night and lay them one by one upon the cabinet by a bedstead, separating flats from longs or wedging the irregulars in between to prop up the assortment of human bulk. Once I finish with the bones, I tackle the organs. <laughs> Plopping them one upon the other is not enough. You've got to cradle each mass in your palms a while, like sculptures carved of jelly. Listen to their sounds, quiet sometimes, sometimes prophesying their annals of love, the minutiae of survival, or what we call life as though that were a file containing myrrh and wormwood tossed together in triplets, when all it was, was a fistful scooped up from the backyard somewhere, seeded, taken root, routed, bearing the detritus of loves and losses of what's left of you and I now. Did you know the spleen is the toughest to house? There's nothing much you can do except splay its purple largeness over all others. Let it filter the remnants of what was or is now, safeguarding blood with memory, buffering reserves of pain and heartaches, or holding moments against the pulsing of the day after day after day. Yes, laying them all out is a task, but putting them back together is an ordeal. You have to wait for the magic fires to strike that first spark, to string them back together into being, as though a lifetime weren't enough already, as though pain were felt in parts, where parts of you and I were always left behind, and wherever we walked, and with whomever we've been spent or broken, we are islands have been forever. And no, there are no sharp bones in the body he'd told me once. Well, that's some relief, as we would have long shred ourselves to bits then before letting others do it. Mm. Yeah. And uh, the next one uh, is a very special poem. It's, it's very close to my heart. And it's about uh, a condition, ment mental health, which uh, goes undiagnosed all over the world. And there are so many people suffering from it. And also the people who love them and who are taking care of them. So, <clears throat> I just have a little bit of water. So this one has a long title. It's called Dementia is the Gradual Impairment of Personality Integration Due to Loss of Neurons in the Brain. The place of no return doesn't always have to be death. Death is overrated. I watch my dad die every day, and every day he lights his fire and toasts to his histories and geologies of a lifetime, as though he were the last living remnant of all there was of him. And every day he pries open with his bare hands the archives of an era that give way to more eras before him. And he scoops up in his palms residues of his loves, the forfeitures of lives lived or those that weren't. And he crouches there day after day upon his cot, fingering the altered maps of his body and what it is now, or how it will be so. And his losses tail me across continents and seek me out. 
and I live with his shadows, bounding like antelopes that are wounded and left for dead everywhere. That's him now, sitting with himself in company. And that's him, knotting, then unknotting strips or shreds that once trapped his flesh and bones in place. He rinses off grime from his hands by the hour, as though that were his blood or his bloodline staining all there is. And often he places his memories like a montage before him. Then all day he sifts from there the vestiges of what once was and is now. No, the place of no return doesn't always have to be death. Death is overrated. I watch my mum sip portions of his death each day like sacramental wine. And I wonder if she will return one day from this place of living where he dies every day. Mm. Mm. That's so yeah. powerful. Mm. That really is powerful. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Um, and the next one, um, is called, love is a one-dimensional word. Again tonight, you can snuff out the picture of the woman you love and release her back into her world. Isn't it strange to watch those lights rise, then fall again inside their tin-squared room? You can see candle smoke spool about her frame and his trailing her many skins that she peels and lets fall into a pool of black. Listen to the clatter, the thud, as she rips loose her jangled bones, her heart, to let drop upon his vinyl floor. Listen to her scrape of toenails seeking their foothold against the bedstead. Now sit still to feel her breath wafted up one more time to graze your flesh before she drags it back into his lilac spreads. You wouldn't want to watch any more, or would you? Yes, withdraw to your wicker chair, an ashtray, the coffee mug you never cared to throw away. Leave her be now, dispossessed of her threadbare skins, the flesh, the bones, the fistful heart. Let the man she beds with each night Taste from her lips and the hollows of her mouth and tongue, the copper droplets, the purple rains. And uh, this one, uh, the annals of loving you. Yes, hold me in your fist, snug like a beating heart, or clench me like grains of sand, and watch me fleeing your grip. I'm unseen, I'm heady like evening air, a melody wafting about. I often think about how your tongue swallowed all the songs erupting from mine, or tried to, as though they were your songs, as though I were yours, as though I couldn't be mine, and how you dropped residues of you in me, in spores or sprigs of memory and pain, that you loved calling love, of when you hurtled off into the rains that night, letting go of me, just when my body had run its course, even though I hadn't. And of how you were shattered to shards, you told me, and not because I didn't care enough for the linguistics of our bodies pirouetting each night to the rhythms of my toes coiled between your calves, or your arms arched about my waist, executing the entrees, the adagios and codas of the grand pas de dieu of our bodies articulating their own cadences of the tugs, pulls or pivots to my side and yours, even in our deepest of sleeps. But more because I didn't want you, and more so because I didn't want me when I was with you or what I'd let become of me. Look! How you now clasp my fingers in yours and touch them to your lips like your kisses were Solomon's seal or they were pips stowed away in my flesh for posterity. And look 
how every once a while I let me humor you into not knowing that I begin where you end. Mm. <laughs> Silence is the loudest word, the heftiest word, bearing the weight of eras and how waiting is a way of life and how people never return from journeys and if they do, it's never an arrival. How parents linger on for the young ones to sprout wings and they never do. Of how words are twisted, they are broken over and over because no one thinks they are remembered or that it matters. Of how lovers love but only in shadows and they await favorable times and forever. Of how men promise they'll pause and they live again when they are free but how days never free them and how time shrinks to a speckle. Yes, silence is the noisiest word in any language. And I know now how my silence lives in that space between mud and fire, between the picking up and picking off of dialogues and how it lulls me to sleep in my mum's belly each night and each night I hear the rumbling of her many silences peeling my world like clockwork. There's still one more to do with you. <laughs> and I'm going to end with the title poem. As uh, Linda suggested, bless her. <laughs> so I'm going to be ending with this. <clears throat> Chronicles of entering my body. I think about how you entered my body, how you knew the way inside out and still lost your way among my scarlet rivers and their tributaries, purple midst the honeycomb crevices, the villi, alveoli, or yes, the trabeculae as they are called, you tell me, those tessellated structures in the heart carrying within them the breath of life. And here's where you buried your sweetest of songs and for safekeeping there inside of me for centuries. When we were both apart, when we were wanderers floating our separate galaxies, not knowing the other existed, but were still part of a whole, sometimes shriveled to a dot, sometimes dotless, swelling, expanding into the universe like songsters seeking strings to string our melodies to. Sentient, stunning our solitudes against walls thick and cavernous grown inside of us and reverberating forever with our own idioms of yearning for our unidentified other. And just as the fetus craves the outside without knowing it does, your entering wasn't the same as his entering or his breaking and hacking of my many bodies to submission because that time I had willingly wed myself to the raison d'etre of life and life's longing for life. Yes, I should know I'm earth, I'm porous sometimes, or I'm laying still, strata upon strata, sprouting my life and his, and I should know I've repaid all my loans to life my allows to the bearings of life for the sake of life and of living. And yes, I do remember how I said, no one arrives in me again without crumbling to ashes because I'm made of fire now and your wind. But still, tell me the chronicles of your entering my body. Tell me how your entering is silent as non-entering in all its entirety or how it is cataclysmic, deafening in its absence. And yes, tell me how you're able to enter and stay the way you do in your strides or the storming with your mind and how the pieces of me you claim or reclaim char and fracture me to bits the way they do. And tell me how they leave large craters and conduits within my flesh my bones, my skin, and how now I have sprigs pushing at the edges there and tiny buds waiting to blossom. Mm.
Well, it's been a real honour no, and fabulous to hear them as well. Yeah. Thank you. I should say that there are some, um, there are a couple of um, videos on the High Pastry YouTube channel. I mean, there are many videos on the High Pastry YouTube channel, um, but there are a couple. Um, where Wupam is um, reading some works and also there's a small one work which is fascinating where you're doing the artwork of the Truvian woman. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, there are several films on there. There's a question and answer that we did um, separately via Zoom, which is quite long, it's about 26 minutes. Um, and you're reading um, a couple of poems as well. Yes. Yeah. Thank so you. yeah, do do check that out if you want to get more of her of hearing the work because mm. it's so different mm. when we hear it. And that was just wonderful to hear those words mm. and phrases come to life mm. like that. It was such a phenomenal and wonderful experience. Oh, thank, thank you, you so that. much. Thank, thank you. you. And I think it was really wonderful because uh, it's an honor to be sitting here. Mm in Hypatia and uh, reading them out here because of uh, what Hypatia stand for. And I think uh, the poem, why it's very close to my heart is because of uh, what Hypatia stand for as well, about the woman, mm -hmm. the earth, and uh, you know what we all go through. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I, maybe that was, I think it's the spirit. Melissa, your spirit, yeah. and you know, uh, such an inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah.